Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us here today for today's webinar on new mindsets for global goals. We're absolutely delighted to have you here to discuss some of the most pressing issues uh, that we'd like to familiarize our students with and what it takes on our part as educators to infuse in our students an enthusiasm and understanding for global goals. My name is Pallavi Devedi and I'm the founder of Higher. To those of you who've been here before, we welcome you once again back to Higher. To those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome to Higher. Higher is an online learning platform for teachers across the world. Our goal has been over the last um, months, few months since we started out, to bring together teachers, school educators, principals, coordinators from across the world and connect you with one another to exchange ideas, to share your learning, your classroom teaching, your practices, and to also learn along the way. So welcome to you once again. And for today's session, we're absolutely delighted to have with us four spectacular people who are right in the middle of either working with people on global goals or uh, inspiring others around the world to work with teachers and students or who are actively practicing what all of us would like to be talking about with our students. So before I get started, I'd like to very quickly uh, take all of you through uh, today's housekeeping rules. Uh, if you just allow me to quickly share my screen with all of you. Um, for today's session, um, we, the panelists are not going to be able to see you or hear you. We will not be using the raise your hand feature for this session, but you're all encouraged to put your questions in the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your screens. Uh, this will help us find your questions faster, although you're more than welcome to use the chat to put down your general observations or share your thoughts and your ideas and just interact with one another. We encourage a lot of healthy debate, a lot of back and forth, a lot of uh, questions, but we, we expect and urge all of you to use the chat box as well as the Q&A box with utmost discretion and kindness. We all know that the world needs as much kindness as it can get today. Uh, the webinar's recordings, as well as all our panelist PPTs, will be emailed to all those of you who've registered. They'll also be available on Hire's website uh, to download and for you all to view later. Um, I have also some very exciting news for those of you who are regulars and who've always been asking us about certificates for webinars. We know that the certificates are important for you, but we always wondered how do we attach more meaning to these certificates as opposed to simply handing out certificates for attendance. So starting this webinar today, we are going to be offering certificates for all of you who've attended the webinar, but there's a little catch. You have to tell us what you learned in this session what you took away from this session before we can actually give you a certificate. You're, you're going to be able to share your learning in three possible ways. You can either send us a sketch note or a drawing uh, which depicts the key takeaways from this session. You can send us a classroom activity or an idea which was inspired by something that you heard from the panelists today. You can also send us a 150 word reflection on an idea that you found most compelling. You could agree with the panelists, you could disagree with them, you could propose something new of your own, but totally and absolutely open to receiving anything and everything that you'd like to share about today's session. And we will most certainly be able to then give you a certificate and attach a little more meaning to that certificate than simply having one for attendance. Uh, so we're, we're, we're going to be looking forward to getting your inputs on this and looking forward to sending out certificates to all those of you who share your learning with us. Um, you're requested to send in an email to contact at Hire um, by Sunday, six o'clock, uh, which is the following Sunday uh, this weekend. And uh, we'll then be reviewing everything that you've sent in and dispatching the certificates accordingly. Um, just to take you all over Hire's big four of quality teaching, um, this is again a reiteration for those of you who've been here before, but to all those of you who are joining us for the first time, 
higher grounds all of its learning events into these big four pillars of quality classroom teaching. The first one being planning for classroom delivery, uh, second being designing instruction, the third one being managing student progress, and the fourth one being practicing professionalism. Today's session actually falls squarely between designing instruction and practicing professionalism. Because today we're gonna to be talking about what you can do for your students, as well as the kind of skill sets that you can build in yourself in order to be able to inspire your students to be change makers. So we are gonna be doing a bit of designing instruction as well as practicing some professionalism today. Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce you to today's panel. Uh, first up, we have Darcy Loon. Darcy is the founder and director of Teaspoons of Change. He's also the group head for sustainability and global citizenship at Dulwich International Schools, Adelaide, Australia. He has been working with schools to design curriculums uh, which incorporate the global goals and the SDGs and has been widely working uh, through his organization, um, Teaspoons of Change, uh, to inspire young people as well as educators to adopt and make small teaspoons of change uh, in their own um, uh, in their own ways of teaching or learning uh, and inspire uh, young generations for the future uh, to make a greater impact on the world. Uh, second joining us and is not a new face at hire is Lenny Dutton. Lenny is the MYP coordinator at the International School of Stuttgart. Lenny is also a blogger and an author. Um, she has been working um, with various um, schools over the years and an integral part of Lenny's teaching and teaching practice are the global goals. As a design thinking teacher, she has been incorporating the global goals uh, in all of her teaching and learning processes. And we're hoping to learn from Lenny today a little bit about how she goes about designing units uh, that actively incorporate the global goals. Last but not the least, we have Anshuman Bhapna. Anshuman is the founder of the world's first online climate school, uh, climate change school, um, Terra.do. Anshuman comes from uh, a startup entrepreneurial background and has now been using uh, his startup entrepreneurial skills to actually inspire young adults to go on and work in areas of sustainable development to join businesses or create businesses of their own um, where there is an where, where the, the focus is on solving for climate change uh, so we're extremely excited to have all three of our panelists here today and we're hoping that between the three of them we will be able to cover lots of exciting interesting things for all of you um, you know in terms of both incorporating uh, aspects of teaching and learning uh, about the global goals in your classrooms, about skills, about how you as teachers can inspire young minds to think differently about the world around them, uh, about how you can encourage young students to take up projects or to take up missions uh, that help to actively solve pressing issues in their local communities or even uh, in the wider global community, in the wider global sense of things. Much of what we're seeing today with a lot of schools having moved online, there's a lot of interaction between schools, between students from various parts of the world. How can we leverage those opportunities today, um, given that we're remote, uh, but connected to more people than we have ever been? So with that, I'd like to pass um, the, the, the floor on to our first panelist for today, uh, Darcy. Darcy, over to you to talk about some frameworks and models that you uh, encourage teachers to incorporate in their classrooms to talk about the global goals. Lovely, thank you very much, uh, Pallavi, and wonderful to be here and, and connecting with, looks like we've got over 280 people on there. That's fabulous. Uh, I'm coming to you from South Australia. It's evening time here. Uh, this is where Don Bradman retired, <laughs> but, uh, but it's also um, where I'm stuck at the moment. I actually am meant to be in China working from there, but, um, but I can't leave Australia at the moment. So I'm doing everything online. So let me share my screen and get into things quickly. Um, so, so I've had my introduction. Let's move on from that. 
Okay, so let's start here with the global goals, if we're talking about all things global citizenship. So, so to me, these global goals, they don't do much, okay, as, as themselves. You know, there isn't a magic button that we can push and they're going to do wonderful things. Um, it's about us connecting to them and, for me, trying to make it personal and practical in our daily lives. Um, so when we look at these global goals, they seem very big, there's a lot of them, and it will scare most people. Obviously, none of you, because you didn't come onto this Zoom call by accident, uh, you're here because you, you have an interest or a passion in global citizenship. So, so for me, I, I wanted to be an entry point to these global goals. I wanted to create something where people could start to, to factor these into their daily life. Now, the, there is a, um, an, a version of these called the Good Life Goals, and these came out of a, a think tank in Geneva associated with Global Goal Number 12. So these Good Life Goals uh, run parallel to the Global Goals, but they're a little bit easier to connect with. They're per more personal and practical. So, so check out the Good Life Goals. I'll uh, endeavour to, to put a link into the notes, etc. They're not designed for students, interestingly. Um, but they're great for teachers to wrap their heads around these concepts and ideas. So, so often with younger students in particular, I use the, the good life goals, older students as well. But then I also make sure I, I expose them to those, those global goals as well. Okay. So, so that's something that might be useful just off the, front, off the bat. Um, so, so teaspoons of change for me are small but significant ideas, attitudes and actions that have a positive impact on people and the planet. So what this means is if we're trying to do these big things on, at the global goals, well, what does that mean to me as one person in the world, as a year five student or whoever we are? So, so this is that, that personal um, and practical way of looking at those global goals. Now, I'll just say one thing that it isn't. So people think, ah, teaspoons of change. If I turn off the lights, then the air in, in, uh, in Delhi will be fine. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is if you turn the light switch off and you have a connection to your actions and their impact, that is significant. And so we, I really like encouraging these small actions because the, the benefit of that small action is very small, but the attitude, the behavior, and, and the habit that, that you're creating is really significant. So for me, it's to try and to put a, a label on those small things which are hard to see. But this, this is where I like to start with a lot of my uh, workshops and things that I run is this question of, well, what is a global citizen? You know, we hear global citizen this, global citizen that, but what actually what it is? I don't like this question. I've got a much better question for you. Well, I think it's much better. Is, are you a global citizen? Now, for me, this question means that your, your answer has to be personal. It is very, very different to um, to what is a global citizen. So I really encourage people to think about, are you a global citizen? Because then you have to answer it in that personal kind of way. What does that look like to you? What do you think it means to be a global citizen? And then the next question after this is, how can we be a more active and effective global citizen? So, so I'll leave that with you. And please certainly ask yourself this question uh, and your students as well. Okay, so for me to kind of quickly summarise all of this is this is the way that I, I try and share it with people so that they can become familiar with the concepts of global citizenship and the, and the SDGs. Is if we're doing our small personal actions, call them teaspoons of change or whatever you want, if we're doing these small actions, that helps us become a better global citizen, which connects us to contributing to those global goals. Okay, that's it. For me, that is, this is the basic premise of global citizenship. Small actions showing how we can be a more active global citizen and contributing to those global goals, okay? So conceptually, it's quite easy. And then the other thing I like about this is working this in reverse. So if we want to achieve these big global goals like gender equality and life below water and, and all these, you know, no hunger, etc. if we want to achieve these big global goals, we need to think as global citizens and act in our personal teaspoons of change. So I suppose what I encourage the most with, with teachers and students and school heads and these sorts of, and businesses as well, actually, is to look at global citizenship as a lens. So at any moment of any classroom, you should be able to ask students or get the students to think about what does this thing look like in a big collective context or with the global goals. And then the flip side of that lens is if we're looking at these big ideas, 
what does this mean to you as an individual? And, and that's, that's pretty much it, is, um, is my main point that I share with schools and teachers and students, uh, just those two lenses that we can use and bring into our classroom. And I, I had to bring in this quote, uh, you know, often attributed to Mahatma Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world. But actually, for me, it's, we need to be the change you can't see in the world. And, and this is the hard thing about our personal actions, is that often they're invisible, particularly in that global context. And I'll give you an example. So I haven't used any plastic bottle for water or any drink or anything for eight years. And I've lived in South Sudan and Pakistan and India and many places. So I carry a little filter and I have to boil my water sometimes, that kind of stuff. But I counted out the number of plastic bottles the average Australian uses in one year and then multiplied that by eight. And so in the picture behind me, that's the number of plastic water bottles that I haven't used. <laughs> and so this is really hard. This is why I call it teaspoons of change, is that when you don't use that plastic water bottle, we have to give it a name. We have to give it a context. So, so that's, uh, that's kind of my example there. And then another model I want to share with you is this idea of help versus harm. So how do we maximize our help and minimize our harm? Now, the important thing is, is that we, we, can, we can't do zero harm. That's impossible. No one's perfect. Even though I'm speaking to you from my self-sufficient tiny house, it does look like I'm, I'm in a cupboard, but this is a tiny house that's off the grid where I, all my electricity comes from solar, all my water comes from the rain, and I have a compost toilet. Um, but I still have harm. You know, obviously, I had to use materials to build this and all sorts of different things. So I use this model for, for students in particular to think about, okay, well, what's your personal help versus harm? And then how do we maximize our help and minimize our harm as much as possible? So I always think about what um, of those good actions, let's try and do more of them and more often. So let me give you a couple of examples from schools around the world that I've, that I've worked in. So this is from UNIS. This is the United Nations International School in Hanoi, Vietnam. And they created a group of students called the SDG Guardians. And so their job was to go around the school find really good examples of what was happening in the school and put a little SDG you know, uh, context to it. And then they would go around the school and find opportunities to incorporate the SDGs. And I'll give you one quick example, is that the, the year three students, um, they, their class had almost gone plastic free completely in their, in their class, which I think in India is probably very co common with your tiffin and <laughs> these things. But in Vietnam, there is a lot of plastic. And the year 12 students, they kept on ordering food with lots of plastic. And so the year three students went and spoke to the year 12s and said, hey, we don't use any plastic in our, in our class because we care about the, the climate. We don't want our plastic going into the oceans and, and into marine life. Um, can, you, can the year 12s, can you please maybe stop ordering things that come in plastic? And initially a few of the year 12s, you know, laughed at them and thought, oh, you're only in year three. But actually some of the other year 12s said, yeah, no, they're right. We need to listen to these year three students. And then they went and did a little presentation about how they were plastic free and all, all these sorts of wonderful things. So I kind of like that example of SDG Guardian. Um, and this is from Australia. So some students were, were learning about uh, fair trade. And, and so they said, you can help end extreme poverty by eating chocolate. And I was like, okay, yeah, cool. That sounds great. I wanted to do that. And they said, ah, but it must be chocolate that's associated with fair trade. And so they talked a lot about what fair trade is um, and all these different things. But the genius of their idea was that when someone ate some chocolate from fair trade, they would keep the empty wrapper. And when they had 10 of those empty wrappers, or I think maybe more, um, they would write a letter to say Nestle and say, we only eat chocolate that is fair trade or ethical. And we want you to turn all of your chocolate into ethical sourced chocolate, supporting farmers, um, with living wages, paying women the same rate as men, all these sorts of different things. So I thought that was a cool idea. And my last example for you is in Canada and uh, some students were learning about polio eradication. So I worked with the Indian cricket team on polio eradication and uh, Amita Bachan, Dobu Zindagi, as he uh, famously says, two drops every time. And, uh, and so these students in, in um, Canada didn't know about polio or didn't know about polio eradication. So we did some presentations and then this little girl, she colored her pinky purple. And then she walked around and everyone's like, hey, why do you have a, a purple finger? And she said, ah, oh, we've learned around polio eradication. Did you know that there were 
350,000 cases of polio in 1988, and then 2018, there were just 33 cases for the whole world for the whole year. And so she used that as a form of advocacy and talking around polio eradication and global health and all these sorts of different things. Um, and my, one of my favorite resources, and I've been very lucky to work with the world's largest lesson. In fact, I helped create a few of their, their lessons, their flagship lessons. Um, so please go there for some great resources and ideas. So I'm, I'm gonna, I have tried to keep that short. I hope I'm, I haven't gone over time. Um, so these global goals, they, they don't do a lot, like I said, but we can try and make them a living, breathing part of, of our vocabulary and give people very personal, practical ideas on how we can integrate them uh, into our daily lives. So I'll leave you with a challenge of thinking about, well, what are your teaspoons of change uh, for you and in your classroom and for your students for them to discover theirs? And often what I've done in India with some schools is that they create like a big list of teaspoons of change that they have in their classroom to remind them of the small things they can do that make a positive impact. And remember that any action, even just small actions, multiplied by lots of people can and will create big change. So this is a really important formula um, that, I, that I try to share with people. Now, hopefully with, in my introduction, um, the people who are, who are following on, Lenny and uh, Anshima, I, I hope that you know, it helps support what they're doing and their teaspoons of change and their approaches. So teaspoons of change isn't a program I, I don't say, right, you should do this, this, and this. It is more of a concept. So I hope you can utilize that to support your teaching in your classes. And uh, I hope we can all be the change that we can't see in the world. And I'm very sad that I can't get to India at the moment, but someday I shall be back, I hope, <laughs> to see you all then. Um, so thank you very much, Pallavi, and thank you very, everyone else for joining in and uh, sharing your ideas with me. So if people want to get in touch, I'll, uh, I'll leave that up there for a moment. I love you. Over to you. Darcy, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think uh, one of the things that I took away uh, from uh, talking about teaspoons of change um, is that you know every little effort that we can encourage our students to make counts, and um, and that all of us as educators don't really need to be experts in any of these global goals to actually be talking about them in our classrooms or to even encourage children to think about them. Um, oftentimes, you know, I, uh, in, my, in my conversations with educators about sustainable development goals or about global goals, one of the things that, that has stood out is that, oh, I don't know enough about um, inequality or I don't know enough about eradicating polio or I don't know enough about conserving marine life. Um, teachers tend to feel that all the heavy lifting needs to be done by them and that if they sort of find out all of these challenges and they put them in a neat little presentation and put it, put it up there for the kids to watch, somehow the children are going to get inspired and then perhaps go out there and take action. What I would recommend instead is that pose a problem, much like what Darcy was suggesting right now. You know, you know that uh, you, you, as educators and even as, as thinking global citizens, we, we're aware of the problems around us. We're aware of the fact that there's too much plastic being used. We're aware of the fact that um, you know, polar ice caps are melting. We don't have to do the heavy lifting for the kids. And that's perhaps one of the best ways in which we can actually get them more involved, you know, get them to ask questions around, so why are the polar ice caps melting? Right? Why is there so much plastic around us? What can we do as individuals, as citizens of the world to perhaps solve that problem? Um, and that also takes away, um, you know, th that, that, that entire pressure on the educator to, uh, to be able to solve um, uh, for all of these different uh, challenges within their own classrooms and then put it in a neat little package and give it to the kids. If we get them to think more about um, what they can do and then perhaps plug in some of the things that you were saying in terms of the teaspoons of change and how some of these very useful frameworks Darcy that you talked about the help and harm framework for example uh, and also to uh, 
um, uh, to talk about um, uh, you know the, the, the other the other variant of the global goals uh, which perhaps would work I think beautifully with even some of the younger kids uh, if you wanted to break it down for them for our uh, primary school students um, so that's I think that's absolutely fantastic the way in which we can actually go around um, encouraging kids to think about some of these things and educate ourselves in in that process as well and and like you just shared kids come up with such fantastic fantastic ways of thinking about some of these things you know the uh, all of the different examples that you just showed us those were absolutely amazing uh, testaments to how student agency um, is actually perhaps the most crucial part in our units uh, designing our units around um, climate change and getting kids thinking about these things um, one of the the questions that came up and I'm going to open this out to you Darcy um, uh, the uh, Putij wants to ask if um, how how can we do some of these activities when we're teaching remotely because a lot of the projects unfortunately that kids may want to go and get engaged with or have been working with in the past have possibly been stalled now um, so what is what is some advice that you would give teachers who'd like to get kids involved in um, global goals online yeah, so I've, I've been teaching online for six months now through this and I think what I've found is that it, it doesn't really change because it's conceptual. We, we can, and even if you can't leave your house, like in many parts of the world, including Victoria in Australia at the moment, is that you can still put up on your fridge or your door or something, a, a little list of, of ideas that you might aspire towards or to remind yourself or as a family and have, have these discussions. But actually to take that a step further is advocacy. So I, I've, I mean, I come from a behavioural change communication background and social mobilisation in, in polio eradication. Um, and so, so I, I love advocacy. So I really encourage people to, to find good people who are doing good things. And there are so many organisations, Lenny and, and Anshman are, are great examples of that. And then find out, you know, what are they doing, learn more about them and then share that with others. And that's certainly something that I feel we can do regardless of where we are or get to know your community or ask interesting questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have more to learn from India than I can certainly share back, but, um, but I, I don't think we need to be limited in advocacy, that's for sure. Absolutely. I think advocacy is such an important thing to also, an important skill to also build in, in students to actually push them to go out there and connect with other people who are doing interesting work that they might learn something from. So maybe remote internships at this point in time. Uh, would make for a really interesting thing for some of our senior students to go and perhaps work with organizations that are uh, with um, work around the, the global goals or organizations that we can perhaps reach out to who might like to come in and talk to our students about uh, some of the work that they're doing. Um, and also very importantly, getting kids to talk to one another um, and people within their immediate local communities make such a huge difference. Um, this is something that we've been doing even when classrooms were, uh, you know, when we had uh, physical classrooms. Um, and some of that, um, uh, that, that thinking through, uh, that talking to people, the, the convincing uh, of people to move to more sustainable ways of life. There's so much that we've picked up in the last six months about the way we live, about consumption patterns, for example, how people have stopped shopping and that hasn't really changed much. Uh, and how, uh, you know, some of the, the things that we eat uh, or the, the ways in which we, um, we the, the recreation patterns that we had, uh, travel, um, the way in which we would approach work, um, even for us as adults, a lot of these things have changed. And that's really changed the way in which we think about um, the way we consume, the way we produce things, the way in which we, uh, we want to think about how our kids would perhaps imbibe some of these habits. So maybe just getting kids to think about the changes around them and how that impacts the global goals would also be uh, a useful uh, entry point into discussions around these. So thank you for that, Darcy. I think um, uh, some fantastic frameworks and models coming out uh, from Darcy. And I'm now going to uh, ask Lenny to take over uh, and give us um, some meat on the frameworks that Darcy has already talked about and build on them uh, to talk to us a little bit about how you go about planning for the global goals within your units uh, and how you go about incorporating some of these um, community issues, world issues, uh, with things that you're talking about in your classrooms. So over to you, Lenny. 
Thank you so much. Um, before I begin on my presentation, I just wanted to say how lovely um, Darcy's presentation was. I'm a teacher, I teach design, and so lots of things he was talking about were making me think of things that we've looked at in design. So I'm just going to tell you about one, which is um, if you go to plasticbottlevillage.com, it's a whole village where the buildings are made from plastic bottles. So again, it gives us that visual of um, all these plastic bottles that we go through. I also know that there's an action organization called the Harry Potter Alliance, which is all about um, service and action, but it's Harry Potter themed. So they had um, something about trans rights in university, and it was the Neville Longbottom Bravery Campaign. They had the Hermione Campaign, which was all about bringing libraries to um, places that had been affected by um, natural disasters. And then they also realized that they were selling chocolate frogs in Universal Studios and all these Harry Potter places, but they were not fair trade. And so these young people campaigned to make all the Harry Potter chocolate frogs um, fair trade. So that was very, very nice. I also love that Gandhi quote, and I think both of the other presenters share the same quote. And I wanted to make uh, to let you know that it makes me think of a quote that I like, which is, be the person your dog thinks you are. So obviously dogs think that we're these wonderful beings that can't do any harm in the world. So it reminded me of that. So I'm going to share my screen now and do my presentation. So hopefully you can see that. So I am the MYP coordinator at the International School of Stuttgart, which is where I'm joining you from now from my office. I write a blog called Excited Educator, and I have two books coming out next year on HODA about MYP design. The first one is out in January and the second one in August. And you'll see in there that most of the units, I think all the units link to the UN Global Goals, but some of the chapters have specific activities around the goals. So what is the point of school? This is something that I ask people very, very often when I do training. And I have students reflect on this well. So what is the point of school? Teaching is a really hard job. It's long hours. You know, it's not always a, people saying thank you and how wonderful we are. So what makes you do it? So I want you to think about that firstly. Then I want you to think about if you were going to ask your students the same question, what would they say that the point of school is? So maybe some people, teachers or students, will say to get good grades, to get into university, to get a career. Maybe they'll also say things like to develop good social skills, to be happy, to develop um, skills that will help us be successful in the workplace, like being a great communicator or being a researcher. Um, so those are kind of the answers I usually hear. I also want you to think, if you were going to ask your students to guess what your response was, or other teachers in your school, or your, or your school's response was, would it be the same? Would those things line up? And hopefully they will. I know that when I was at school, the focus was really on um, passing exams and going off to college. And I think the, that was the school's purpose, and the teachers who were teaching otherwise, like teaching actual things about global issues, were kind of the rebellious teachers who were doing what they shouldn't do. But hopefully nowadays most schools are focused on uh, positive things. So often people will say that the point of school is for students to be successful. And that is great. I want my students to be successful emotionally. I want them to be successful financially. I want them to um, be able to go out and live uh, happy, fulfilling lives. But I want more than success. So I don't just want my student to go out and become the world leading uh, arms dealer or them to be a landlord that is very rich and wealthy and happy but exploits many people. I want them to be successful. But I also want them to have a positive impact on the world. The other thing that we often hear is that the point of school is to prepare students for life after school or outside of school. And this kind of implies that school begins after graduation or that uh, we say also uh, the real world, that the, what happens to them now, and what they care about now, what they're doing now isn't purposeful. But they can actually make a positive impact on the world now. They do not have to wait till their 18th birthday. Um, so my theme for design, and this is across every grade in every unit, is how can we use design to make the world a better place? And so this is why we use the UN Global Goals in every single unit. We will have some units that are completely focused on the UN Global Goals, where students will explore what the goals are, they'll pick a goal that they're interested in, they'll design something to, related to that goal, or we might be doing a unit on a specific goal, or we might be doing a general unit, and then at certain points we bring in the goals as a reflection or we think about um, links to those goals. I think that if every subject had this focus about how you can make the world a better place, 
students would see that it's not just people in school or in uh, careers that have to be working like as a climate change scientist who can make an impact or someone working for an NGO you could go into any career and still be doing it in a mindful way. So you might not be a climate change uh, scientist, but you could be a fashion designer and you could be making clothes that are sustainable. This kind of fits in with the point of the UN Global Goals as well, is that it's not up for someone else to solve these, solve these things and help us reach the goals. Yes, obviously we want governments and organizations to take a big role in that, but every single individual can help us to um, reach that goal. I snuck a little link in here, so after my chat, I can put it in the chat, or maybe one of the other panelists will put it in, and it is just an activity how I start every single class with a mystery object on the board, and students have to guess what the object is, and often those are objects that are uh, things like a child-friendly uh, diabetic pen, or maybe a life straw to help someone filter dirty water, so I give, I'm exposing students to these examples of design that are making a positive impact in the world. So then we think about what is worth learning. And I know that Darcy spoke a lot about kind of these big concepts and definitely in NYP it is a conceptual based classroom so that kids can transfer what they know in school to the careers, to outside of school, to hobbies, to other conversations. Um, but we also maybe want to think about skills that students need and also content. So I think it's a nice way to break it down into these four areas. So I have local and global issues. So the kind of facts that we want students to know. But we need more than that. We can't just tell them about um, people who don't have access to clean water. It needs to go beyond them having these facts. So the next thing is empathy and perspective taking. So helping students understand the point of view of the people affected by these things so that it makes them care. And also that empathy can include thinking about um, the perspectives or the point of view or the understanding of the people that are maybe causing some issues or are not acting positively because that helps us to better understand their motivations too. The next thing is inquiry, so having students follow their passions, so creating units which give students kind of options to explore different paths. And then lastly, how to make a difference. So we don't just want students to do work, um, like an essay and turn that in, we want them to actually make a difference. So I'm gonna go into these four sections in a little bit more detail. So firstly, local and global issues. And whenever you're looking at any local or global issue, you can always connect it to the bigger theme. So for example, you might be looking at lack of sanitation in villages close to your school, or you could be looking at sexism in the media, and you could then go back to these goals and think about which ones do they connect to. Again, we're thinking about these goals as big themes. You can obviously go into the website and click on the goals and go in and see all the specific targets and the specific data and how countries are achieving them. But even if we're just mentioning those goals as a theme or making that connection, I think it's very important. The next thing is empathy and perspective taking. So I work in design, so this is a very big part of our unit. In fact, at the beginning of every single unit, we look at our client or our customer, and we do different activities. We might make an empathy map, which will show us um, what, a student, uh, what the client thinks, feels, uh, their influences. Um, and I've put a link here to a page about empathy maps. When you get the full link to this presentation or afterwards as well, I can share some more. So I have them down in the speaker's notes. There's also this lovely video here about empathy. And it says, you do not need to share someone's opinion to acknowledge or understand it. There's also many thinking routines that are coming out of um, uh, Harvard University's Project Zero that help us not just uh, reflect on a picture, but dig a bit deeper, dig a bit deeper into issue. So for example, if I just said to my students, here's a news article, there's some photographs, what do you find? They're not gonna maybe think about it in any depth, but I say, okay, pick one of the people in the photographs on that issue. What do you think a question that is from their viewpoint? What do you think um, they feel about this issue? How does it affect them? So these different routines that are linked here as well will really help students with their empathy. You can see one here that we did uh, in my last school, we did an issue about uh, uh, IDU, interdisciplinary unit, about human migration. And so the questions were, why does it matter to me? Why does it matter to my school? And why does it matter to the world? So even doing simple things like that will help our students to build empathy. The next thing is how to follow passions. So giving students a lot of options. So for example, I do a grade six unit where my students look at human impact on the environment 
and it's an interdisciplinary with design and languages. And so we purposely don't do sciences and we don't do the humanities. And we say, okay, as more creative subjects, how can we raise awareness of an issue that is linked to human impact on the environment? And what are the ethics behind that? Are we allowed, is it persuasion? Is it propaganda? Are we allowed to use creativity to raise awareness? Where's the ethical line there? So it's nice, interesting, you know, they debate about. But what happens is they get to choose what they're interested in. They might be interested in river pollution. They might be interested in endangered animals. They might be interested in deforestation. And then they can pick the relevant UN Global Goal as well. <laughs> what you'll find with the younger grades, particularly grade six, is that mostly they care about animals. So mostly they choose life below water or life on land. But I think as they get older, they pick, uh, global goals that are more human focused. And then lastly, how to make a difference. So I do want to have a shout out to our services action coordinator who um, spoke to me about this theme of treasure, talent or time. So our students can make a difference in a variety of way. Firstly, if you just give your students an audience bigger than you, they're not just handing an essay to you, their teacher, but maybe they are presenting their essay to the other class in that grade. Or maybe you're putting a little website together and it's a advert they've made about uh, life below water and then the parents can see it that makes a big difference and then building in these opportunities for action so it could be treasure which could be ra raising or donating money talent creating something to raise awareness or solve a problem directly so often that one comes up in design but it could be creating an animation it could be um, creating a campaign at school and obviously volunteering as well now as a uh, as Darcy was speaking a few people popped in and asked about uh, doing stuff online and so I just put two links here do something is a website I think they're America based but you can go and you can search by issues you can look at issues to do with gun violence or issues to do with racism or issues to do with um, gender equality and it gives you loads of different ideas for campaigns that you could do and some of them are ones you can do online and some of them are ones that you can do um, in person and then Amnesty International's Take Action it's loads of different um, campaigns that they're working on now and it gives you an overview of the campaign and then a very basic way you can take action is signing your name signing your email and it might send an email directly to a person in power or it might be signing a petition um, so this raises awareness but also lets you do that small little thing um, but also make it student initiated we also already talked about students following their passion so allow them to come up with ideas they will come up with much more creative ideas than we ever ever could so what is worth doing? So this is where I'm going to show you some of my units. So I've already talked about a couple of these, but one of them is UN Global Goals Unit. Students pick a goal and they make a 3D prototype linked to that goal. So I could just do a 3D design CAD unit as a design teacher, but that's not meaningful. Whereas this one, I had students do things like one student made a bottle bank. So in, in Germany, you can take your bottles to the supermarket, you put them in the machine and money comes out. Her bottle bank design that she had was it had an interactive screen and you could choose one of the three charities and that money went straight to the charity. The next unit was about sticker design and so just being, um, you're going to learn how to use Adobe Illustrator and make stickers. What they did was they researched a global goal and then they found a charity that was linked to that goal and they created stickers which they then sold to raise money for that charity. Another one I have is for my grade sixes and it's about educational video games. So. They're making video games for the grade fives to help them deal with coming into grade sixes, uh, into grade six into middle school. And we also look at the digital divide. We also look at how their access to having a laptop in every class is different to other schools that have maybe it once a week. Other schools that have no laptops or have no electricity. And so they're looking at um, goals of quality education and reduced inequalities in that. And then the human impact uh, on the environment you know, that I talked about. I'm happy to give more examples as well, but I wanted to give you some tips. You do not have to be an expert at any of the goals. You don't have to know everything. Learn alongside your students. So the same way that if I'm doing a coding unit, I don't have to know every single coding language. Maybe I'll teach um, some Java, but then I, if a kid wants to do Python and they want to do another coding language, go ahead. I'll learn with you or I will trust you. I'll send you the resources you need. Um, there are many resources online to support you in the goals, including some really nice animations if you're looking on YouTube that are aimed at all different ages. Make the goals visible in your classroom. So I have them printed, I, I guess, about 25 centimeters by 25 centimeters each goal. 
laminated on my wall. So often I can just say, oh yeah, yeah, which gold is this linked to? So it's very natural and it comes up uh, regularly. Um, think about your students' current passions. I bet you can link them to goals. So I know that I have a lot of students in my school who are issued in, uh, interested in issues to do with gender and sexism and sexuality. So we've just started a club, uh, Services Action Lunchtime Club, which deals specifically with that. Again, the best student action is initiated. And then the Sustainable Development Report site is a website that last year was not that good looking. They have made it really nice. So I'm going to also show you this. This is a really nice um, website that gives you lots of data about the goals. And even my grade sixes, so 10, 11, 12 year olds use this. They can look at a map and they might choose a, uh, countries, maybe they're going to look at India, and they can see exactly how they're doing with each goal. So they could click on no poverty and it will give them um, more information about like globally as well. There's also data explorer, so if you're a math teacher, you can go and look at the individual targets and you can look at the data in there. Um, so I think this is really, really, really cool. So hopefully that kind of gives you an insight to how I look at the UN Global Goals, how I read them in easily into my classroom. I never had to rewrite my whole curriculum or anything. It was a very easy, natural process. If you want to keep in contact or find out more, you can visit my blog at exciteducator.com. I've put in my LinkedIn link. And I'm also on Twitter at Lenny Dutton. So thanks so much. Passing back over to Pallavi, who I know that I, I say Pallavi, same way that I say Darcy. <laughs> so I apologize for dragging out my A's. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Lenny. I, uh, after that fantastic presentation, I don't think I can possibly ever fault you for mispronouncing my name. There were so many ideas in there that I think it would take me at least a week to go over your presentation to simply pull out the ones that I love the most. Uh, and I'm sure that everybody here is going to feel exactly the same way after we send across the PPTs uh, to all the participants. Um, this is, I think, one of the most amazing things um, about what you shared today with us is that um, we don't always need uh, to think about large, big ideas when we think about impact. You know, and I think that that also goes, um, it also connects back to what Darcy was saying. Um, small things that help action change uh, can always be built into our curriculums, can always be built into wider school activities, everything from uh, school assemblies to, um, you know, to talking about um, uh, interclass, interclass or intersection or integrate uh, competitions with students, all of those and challenges that we want to build, even remotely, much of this is possible. So, uh, you know, where you, where you talked about um, getting students to design stickers uh, for the SDGs, um, it's, it seems like a small task, but it also involves the student going out there, finding things about that SDG that they want to capture in a sticker, something that's important to them, something that means something to them, and it doesn't always have to be something world changing or ground shifting. It can, something very, very simple and something very, very small can also action uh, or inspire children uh, to take action, uh, you know, with uh, connecting with uh, the SDG of their personal choice or something that resonates with them personally. Um, one of the ideas, one of the questions that um, uh, you know came up while uh, all of you were talking is that uh, when we think about uh, problem solving and design thinking and when we try and connect that to uh, global goals I think Lenny you're perfectly poised to answer that question in terms of what sort of design thinking routines would you like to build uh, into your lessons in order to encourage conversation around the global So for design thinking, I, I know there's all these different processes you can do, the five steps of design thinking. Um, but what I just think about is you have a problem and you have to solve it. And to solve the problem, you need to understand it better. So that you need to understand the people it affects. You need to understand the reasons for it to happen. Um, and then you need to think about making a solution, but also making a solution which is best for that client. And you can't always think about the initial problem. So for example, I know that Darcy talked about um, drinking water through a filter. And so there's this fantastic live stream. I'm just gonna shoot across on my um, wheelie chair and show you guys. Uh, I 
So this is the um, live straw, which you might recognize, and they're very, very cheap, and they are funded partially by the Carter Center in Atlanta, who are dealing with the eradication of diseases like the guinea worm, uh, river blindness, um, very, very cool. But what one company found out is you need to go beyond that. So one company found out that people are not using it. And so they commissioned these um, computer graphic designers, I guess, to create a virtual reality game. So they would take it to children in Cambodia who lived on this really dirty river, who would travel to school in the river, play in the river. And they made this game where they would put the, the goggles on and they would be fighting river monsters. They'd be shooting the monsters, these big alien species, and they'd fight them. And then in the end, they'd say, okay, well, now you need to go out into the world and fight these real river monsters. So this is how you're going to do it. So they didn't just have to make the live straw, but then they had made this extra thing that thinks about uh, user experience, human, human um, interaction and motivation. And so they made this much better solution. Um, one unit which I'm happy to share with anyone, I can just, uh, I'll share it in a minute, is that I start all of my grade sixes with a unit where they get given a fictional character. And so it might be a pirate, it might be a magician, and they get a, a few illustrations and they have to really look and think about what is the problems and motivators of that person. So for example, they realize the pirate, he has this hook for a hand, so there's one picture where he's trying to do up his buttons and he can't do it. So maybe his hook is a hindrance. There's another part where he's, you can see that he actually collects parrots and exotic birds. And so he's using his hook for the bird to sit on. So okay, it has a benefit as well. So you can also look at things and learn a little bit about his character and then you design the product for them. Instead of students just saying, you're making something for a pirate, where they would just design something with a, a skull and crossbones, make, maybe make it waterproof, they have to dig deeper. So that's a really nice introduction unit. I've done this with grade sixes. I've done it with older students with my language acquisition colleague in my last school. So they were then wanted to learn extra vocabulary, like what is werewolf? What does all these things mean from their character card? But you could easily scale that down for um, a grade one or two class. So in a second, I will um, go into my other browser, my school browser, and I'll put the link in for everyone as well. That's fantastic. Hopefully that helps. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Lenny. And uh, to all those of you who just asked whether all of Lenny's fantastic links will be made available. Yes, the presentations for all panelists will be made available to all of you. And um, Lenny is also going to be doing a workshop with us uh, in the first week of October. So stay tuned for that announcement for those of you who'd like to learn more from Lenny and learn more about her fantastic ideas. Make sure that you sign up for her workshop that's coming up. Um, and I think, um, you know, when we're talking about design thinking and we're talking about creative problem solving. Those are some very important skills that we would want our students to develop. And I think from both Darcy and Lenny's presentations, one thing is clear. We don't need to be experts to get our students to develop problem solving skills or to get them to think creatively about situations that need immediate solving for. What are some of the skills that we as adults, as educators need? And I think, Anshuman, you're, you're best poised to answer that question for us. Um, you're currently working with adults. Um, you're you're in, the, in the front line uh, working with people who want to actively go out there uh, and get jobs or start businesses or support businesses or support organizations that are working actively to solve for climate change. Um, what are some of these skill sets that you find in common with all of these people? And what do you think um, should that, that set of skills look like for school teachers uh, when we're trying to engage our students in, um, in problem solving for uh, global goals, um, you know, climate change being a part of uh, that bucket uh, of things as well. So over to you, Anshuman. Uh, looking forward to hearing from you on that. Thanks, Valerie. And uh, thanks, everyone, for being uh, here. Uh, this is a fantastic turnout. And I'm just so glad that uh, all the insights that Darcy and uh, Lenny shared, I got a, got a chance to kind of go through them as well, given what I'm doing. And uh, so I'm here uh, uh, at the other end of the world, uh, unlike Darcy, uh, I'm at uh, on the campus of Stanford University where there have been wildfires and completely orange and red skies. And we just moved from, uh, from Bangalore about two months back. So the kids, unfortunately, their whole association is that uh, it's as hot as India, it's as much smog as India, and it's amazing. So uh, they're, they're loving being here but not for the right reasons. And that's the thing that uh, I really want to talk about uh, in this talk. So let me just share my screen. Okay, there you go. 
Yeah, so that's my official picture. Uh, uh, like to, at a time when I was uh, in corporate life, I was working at Make My Trip right before this. And uh, uh, otherwise, I've been an entrepreneur most of my life. Uh, generally, just a uh, lot more focused on uh, just building things, throwing them out into the world and see what happens. And so the thing that I'm working on right now, is called Terra Doc. Do. So Terra is Earth and Do is Do, as opposed to just talk or as opposed to just uh, just, just think about it. And uh, think of us like an online school, except focus on people who are thinking about climate change. And we have this whole 12-week program that uh, uh, people can be part of, where we take them through everything about climate, from science to what's happening in different sectors and so on. And then we, more importantly, put them inside a community of people like them, kind of what Pallavi is building at higher uh, for teachers and educators in general. Um, and then we expose them to as many opportunities as possible, problems, organizations, companies that are working on climate. So that's kind of the core idea. Now, uh, when Pallavi uh, reached out to me for this particular panel, my first question was, I don't know anything about working with teachers. Uh, so, uh, or, or with, with, with students, because most of our uh, cohort is like this, so that we teach adults. Um, we have people who have been uh, working in all kinds of different jobs for a long period of time. And the fundamental question that they're trying to answer is, how can I use my skills to solve for climate change? So we could have someone like a Toral, who's an investigative journalist, or uh, Ryan, who had been working at Google for 20 years now. Um, and we take them and we kind of train them and try to deploy them. Uh, on climate problems. Now, uh, when, when, and Palomi had a great point when she pushed back and she said, no, I mean, uh, in a way you have to solve for this, right? Which is that, uh, uh, and I'm quoting this quote and, and misquoting it on purpose, which is be the change you wish to see in the children. So as educators, if that is kind of our, uh, our intent, then um, we have to go out and, uh, and, and see what stops us right now or what, what constraints are we are bound by. And one of the things that I've found very interestingly is that uh, adults, when they are focused on something which is remunerative, which makes money, which pays them better, has one of these material goals in life, they're fairly transactional. Uh, but when it comes to something which is mission oriented and SDG goals are climate changes, uh, suddenly their curiosity and their openness and their willingness to unlearn comes out. And that's something that you've felt and seen with every single person who's been part of our online school. And that's exactly what, uh, what kids and children bring, bring to the table. I have a 11 year old and a six year old, and I have lots of stories that uh, I'll try to interweave uh, in what I'm gonna tell you now. Uh, but yeah, so kind of my very first uh, thing as an adult is that, I mean, in, in US colleges, for example, when you think about uh, doing your undergrad or then you think about what you're majoring in. And then the majors are all these very fixed, defined things. But as adults, as teachers, as, uh, as entrepreneurs, as uh, individuals in, in the society, I, I believe that uh, actually there's a different way of thinking about this. Instead of thinking about majors, you could think about missions. And then you pick up a mission and it could be any of these SDG goals. And then everything that you learn, do, et cetera, could integrate into that single mission. Uh, and that's what uh, I would love to talk a little bit more about. So, uh, yeah, so first of all, if you are to be the change that you want to see in the children, then how does your own thinking need to shift? And there's this kind of uh, four-step cycle that I borrowed from Pallavi, uh, which I thought I'll take you through the next uh, few minutes. One is empathy, which is uh, you have to figure out why do you care? Uh, and, it's entire, and, and not caring is also an answer. Um, it's not a judgment call, but I think you have to fundamentally go deep down and say, well, why do I care about this issue? Um, second is that, well, when you're designing uh, for solutions for, for that or thinking about it, there are some inherent biases and constraints that you have put, your, put uh, uh, yourself in. And those constraints, by the way, can need, need not just negative. Constraints often end up helping you to design something beautiful and elegant because the world is full of constraints. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. The third step is play. And play is, well, you're now collaborating. Now you're working with someone else. What do you choose to build together? That's a very conscious choice that, uh, that you should be thinking about. And the last one, and the one that I uh, honestly care the most about is, is stories, uh, which is you see stories that fundamentally answer the question, so what? Who cares? Uh, why does it even matter? 
So that's something which uh, I'll take you through. So let me start with the uh, empathy. And there's a bunch of pictures. I don't have uh, research studies. I don't have anything fancy, just my own personal life stories to share. So the very first part about empathy, which is why do you care? Uh, we all have different reasons. Uh, it could be something in our past that makes us care for a certain uh, one of these SDG goals, something that we saw uh, personally growing up in the community and societies that we lived in. It could be our future. And in, in your case, um, uh, the beautiful mission that you're on, uh, which is our children, uh, that's, that's a big, big part of uh, sometimes what motivates us and what, why we care. And it could sometimes be search for meaning. I mean, I'm, I, in fact, my whole awakening happened as kind of a, the perfect kind of a midlife crisis that you can imagine. And the midlife crisis is triggered by the fact that uh, I was trying to figure out what, uh, uh, how to find meaning. And often some of us find it in different areas, in religion or something else. But all of these are, uh, the answers are not important. It's, it's the questions that are important. And the two pictures here that I just thought I'll kind of share my personal story. So this is my daughter who was, uh, uh, who was seven at the time when this picture was taken. We were in uh, Darcy's backyard, uh, relatively speaking. We were in the Great Barrier Reef and my daughter was uh, snorkeling to see the corals. And uh, she was singing and, uh, and while I was snorkeling along with her, I could hear her singing in the water because she was just transported by the beauty of these corals. And my son at that time, who's five years younger, was about two and a half or three at that time, could not obviously snorkel. So he was waiting on the boat for his chance to come when he grows up. Now, it turns out uh, this is 2016. And 2016 was the first of the many years since then when, because of global warming, 30% of the, of the entire coral reef died. Uh, yeah, and that's something which has been happening year over year over year. So my moment of awakening, my empathy came from the fact that I realized that while my daughter got to see the Great Barrier Reef, this beautiful natural wonder, my son might not. Right? In fact, entire next set of generations might not see this at all. And the other picture is from one of my favorite uh, spots in California. This is a national park um, and this is called Yosemite. And this is literally the picture from two days ago. And this is what uh, uh, noontime looked like. Uh, there were fires on all sides. The entire sky was lit with, uh, uh, with orange and red hues. It felt like you were on Mars. And it felt like uh, this is our, our future um, was already in our present with all that was happening with climate change. So these are my trigger points for caring about this deeply enough to dedicate my many years, many, many decades to this. But you have to answer that question for yourself first. Uh, second thing on the design part, which is, uh, and, 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 and I, I, by the way, love the fact uh, of being an outsider in the climate space. And when any one of you decides to pick up the SDG goals, you will be an outsider because that's not what you've been doing all your life. And the power of the outsider is to see the elephant for what it is, as opposed to what an expert would, would see it as. So you come into a space like climate, you have um, scientists, for example, who might, I mean, maybe the scientists are probably the only ones who are seeing it rationally. But if you're, if you might see economists and Nobel Prize winning economists who might believe that the entire problem is because we haven't taxed pollution. If we can just put a tax on pollution, everything will get solved. Or you could run into a, a Silicon Valley entrepreneur in my backyard uh, who might believe that, oh, this is not a problem. Technology will solve all of these problems. We'll just invent nuclear fusion or something that will solve for climate change. And then you have uh, people like Naomi Klein uh, who thinks and, who, and, and uh, believes that uh, it's a fundamentally an issue about inequity that has persisted for centuries between the global south and the global north and therefore a massive development aid transfer or something of that sort would potentially solve the problem. And the reality is that all of these are true, but all of these do not capture the full uh, uh, scale of what climate change uh, needs or an SDG goals in general need. And therefore the question that you need to ask for yourself, uh, ask yourself is what are your biases that have stopped you uh, from, from thinking about this? I had, I listed out the ones that I had about a year back when I was thinking about uh, climate change. And uh, the third one is probably the one that I've heard the most often from everyone else, which is, well, this seems like by definition, a global problem uh, and what can a single individual do? And, to, and I think uh, to, to, to Darcy's point, which is, I mean, there's, there's this whole teaspoons of, teaspoons of change way of thinking. 
Um, and more importantly, just acknowledging that you have this bias that an individual cannot make a difference is something to just under, understand, underline, because it's the same thing that your students will also be going through when you, when you talk about these SDG goals. So therefore, just, just write down your biases and think about them more, in a more structured way. Now, uh, what do you build together? So I thought I'll just take an example of uh, how all of us in this world have been uh, forced to become educators in these uh, times of coronavirus. So, uh, and, and by the way, in the process, learned what an incredible service that, uh, that teachers like yourselves do to humanity, to all of us, and uh, how hard it is and how meaningful it is. So thank you, first of all, uh, I think that's kind of the one silver lining for, for what's happening with this, with this pandemic. But this is something that uh, I ended up doing. My daughter was getting bored out of her mind, you know, in during the summer vacations, and so were her friends. So I ended up starting like a small school just for a couple of them, which ended up becoming, um, at some point in time, 10 to 12 kids. Um, and we, our, our, our way of thinking was very play-oriented, which is, let's just pick up a topic that we really like, enjoy, and then we'll build something as we go along. And we'll build it together. So the very first step in that was that, so for example, the first topic that the girls came back to me with, um, and they, these are all typically 10 to 11 year olds, and they came back and said, well, we really want to build our dream house. They said, okay, fine, let's, let's go solve the dream house problem. And let's start out with step one. And the step one was, well, let's just uh, completely unshackle our imagination. Let's go out and see the most extraordinary homes out there in the world that people have built. And Netflix has this amazing documentary uh, which covers these homes. So the kids watched that. And then the assignment for them was to go to Pinterest and build uh, their dream house. What would their uh, study look like? What would their bedroom look like? And, and you know, 10-year-old girls, they just went completely nuts on this assignment. It was fantastic to see their imagination run wild. Um, so then I introduced the next constraint, uh, which was, well, in reality, you have to go out and build these things, right? So let me get you a world expert in construction of houses, which happened to be my wife, and, uh, and have her talk through what it takes to build a house, uh, what kind of structural things you have to keep in mind, what kind of engineering problems you might encounter. And the assignment was to then take this and take a version of your dream house and convert it into uh, SketchUp, which is this free software that allows you to just build houses with all the right kind of engineering constraints. And that was the first time when, as they were building it together, they realized that the world has all these kinds of interesting constraints that allow you to uh, uh, both be creative, but at the same time, uh, also tamper down your ambitions in the right direction. So, so far, this is, this, is, this is what they got. Uh, and then we switched the question again and we said, okay, now that we have imagined our dream house, now we know a little bit about how, what it might take to build something like that. Let's go see how the rest of the world lives. And there's this beautiful movie, uh, it's actually in virtual reality, called Clouds Over Sidra, which is basically about this 12-year-old uh, girl called Sidra who lives in a refugee camp in Syria. And it's just a day in her life, how she goes to school, what she eats, how she hangs out with her uh, um, uh, younger brother and so on. And after watching this movie, the assignment for the kids was, well, now go and build not just one house for yourself, but a community of houses. Imagine that you had Sidra and all her friends um, and their families that you had to relocate, it, relocate into a new town. Go out and build that town and see what comes out of that. And this is how you uh, I think the, the, to me, the brilliant part about all of this, the way it uh, shaped up was that it was completely organic. None of it was pre-planned. It just like the girls led the direction um, as they were playing through this concept, as they were building together into something that eventually led them into effectively uh, one of the biggest humanitarian crises that we have in our times right now organically. And in a way that left this very deep impression on them. So there was just this idea that uh, you allow a little bit of unconstrained creativity, you allow uh, a lot of exploration to happen and in ways that uh, where the kids will often end up uh, leading you uh, in very interesting directions than what you could have imagined when you started out. And the last one, which is uh, my favorite, the stories. Uh, so very, very important to answer the question, so what? Like, why does it even matter? And there are many, many ways of thinking about that. But one thing that I really, one aspect that I really love is this whole envisioning 
part of it, which is that when you're thinking about these SDG goals and you're thinking about the effort that you might put in as an individual, it's also important to, see, to kind of visualize and see, well, if this gets solved, what would the world look like? So at Terra, uh, our first assignment to everyone who comes in is actually uh, this, which is where we say, look, it's the year 2040, 20 years have passed from now. Uh, the climate crisis is solved. Tell us the story of what happened between 2020 and 2040 and what was the role that you played. And people have to write an essay. And basically what they're doing is they, they're doing this envisioning exercise of uh, almost suddenly turning on the, even the possibility of thinking that yes, this can actually get solved. And yes, that you would play a role in making that happen. So it's this thing is this document that they keep coming back to over and over again throughout the entire program. And another example of an envisioning is, I mean, I grew up in this uh, town called Sahanpur. Uh, and I used to hear all these urban legends, it seemed like, of how there was a time when you could see the Himalayas from Sahanpur. Um, and I would never believe it because Sahanpur is just like most of the UP towns, very, pollution, uh, very polluted. And then of course, COVID happened. And suddenly we had uh, pictures like this showing up in the media of uh, what, uh, what it looks like from, from, from your balcony when you're living in Sahanpur. And what it does is that it envisions for you a possibility of a different future and even a different present that you had never contemplated, that you had always thought was not possible. So therefore, writing down those stories, bringing them to life uh, for yourself and for the children that you teach is such an important part of what you do. Um, this other example is, is of uh, setting the right kind of role models. So that my, that's my daughter. Um, and last year, we were lucky enough to meet this woman called Erica Bulsi at Stanford. And she runs this nonprofit that builds uh, virtual reality experiences uh, of, uh, of scuba diving and underwater biodiversity. And she was just about to launch a movie, uh, which is about to premiere. And we met at a cafe. She had got the headset with her. And uh, Neva put it on. And I have this video of her, which I don't have the time to show, where literally you can see her transported, her jaws drop. And when she picks up the headset, she's a completely different person uh, altogether. And the interesting thing is not just what Erica was doing, but the fact that it was Erica. So Erica is this very unusual character. Uh, first of all, she's a woman in a field which is often uh, dominated by men. Uh, second, she's, uh, she has a life history where she went across so many different paths and careers to arrive at, uh, at something that she really loves to do. And for my 10-year-old daughter to see someone like her was such an important role model uh, uh, that I think that she keeps referring back to subconsciously over and over again. The same thing for you, which is, are there role models for you that, uh, that you can envision, that you can, that you can think about when you think of these SDG goals? And can you bring those role models to life for your kids as well? Uh, and the last one, and this, uh, this is kind of my favorite, it's a little bit technical, but so pardon me for that, but I hate this framework. So this is, this is how we've always thought of the world economy uh, as this kind of the circular flow of money and goods nicely between households and companies and taxes and uh, goods and GST and whatnot, right? And all that this points to is that growth is good. GDP growth is amazing. The, the more, the better. Uh, but the reality is that this is not really circular. There are all these uh, inputs like natural resources and there are all these uh, bad outputs like pollution that we create in this economy that are not part of our thinking. So the fact that we've been taught this framework in economics textbooks for the past 70, 80 years is, is a tragedy. Uh, in fact, therefore, the search for a better framework is something that, uh, that, that I think is super important. And one that I did come across was by this uh, economist at Oxford called Kate Raworth. It's called the donut economics model. It's literally like a donut where the thinking is that uh, the inner layer is what the, social, what, what the minimum social needs for humanity are. The outer layer of the donut is the ecological ceiling, meaning what can the planet support? And humans are best in the middle of those two layers, not in the center, not, not closer to the center where we are not even meeting fundamental human rights, gender, equality, food, et cetera, et cetera. And definitely not on the outside where a lot of the developed world right now is, which is breaking through all these ecological boundaries and doing ozone layer depletion, ocean acidification, and so on. So there is a sweet spot where humans thrive. And this is, this is math. This is an economics model 
But the fact that we've been always thinking about this model for the past say, 80 years, and if only we can find a better framework, something like this to think about the world. I think that's, 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 a, that's a place as a teacher, as an educator that we have to start thinking about. And the last thing, which is that uh, uh, in reality, those four steps that I showed you um, are not linear. In fact, the best things in life are circular. So caring uh, and then going to acknowledging your biases, then building together and finally telling that story to yourself uh, and to everyone around you, then restarts the caring loop and gets more and more people, more and more children involved in that. So that's my request to you uh, to, to start thinking about this loop in your life as well. Um, I'll just put this up uh, for everyone to look at for a second, uh, but happy to um, answer questions in the remaining time that we have. Anjuman, thank you so much. I think um, if there's one, one thing that, that stood out to me um, in your entire session, over and above everything you talked about um, in terms of the, the frameworks and the ways in which we can think about empathy and storytelling and so on, is what a fantastic role model as a father you are. And I think um, for us as educators in classrooms, that is perhaps one of the most important things to be able to do, to be able to show by example or lead to an example, which you have done so beautifully. You've connected your kids to real life experiences. You've connected them to real life heroes and role models, people who can possibly inspire them and prompt them to take action or to think differently about things around them. You've, um, you've opened them up to situations in the world that might impact them. Uh, this also includes your move to San Francisco where you know, you've now put them in unfamiliar surroundings that look like home for not the right reasons. Uh, and you know, looking at how they respond to that. And I think uh, what we try and, and recreate in classrooms is very similar to what parents try and do back at home. Um, and what we actually can take away more than anything else from what you just talked about is how some of these, um, these frameworks and these models that you talked about can be recreated in the classroom to, uh, to point our students to things around them that directly impact them. So thank you for that, Anjuman. I think this was, it was absolutely wonderful uh, to hear from you both about your experiences as an entrepreneur, as somebody who's, uh, who's interacting with adults uh, who are going out and trying to make a positive change in the world, uh, as a father, uh, as somebody who's a role model to young kids. Uh, so thank you for that. And thank you for bringing in so much fantastic perspective uh, to the session today. Unfortunately, we're, we're a little over time. Uh, and I know that there are a few questions that have not been answered. Uh, I'm gonna try and pick up a couple of them from here uh, and try and just put them across to, uh, to Lenny, to Darcy and to Anshuman, and then we'll try and close uh, today's session. And I know we've taken up a little more of your time, uh, teachers, than we had originally promised you we would. Um, so uh, one question that, that came up, and um, Lenny, if you wanna take this up, or if Darcy, if you wanna take this up, one of the questions that came up in the chat is that um, as educators, oftentimes um, it's difficult to find time uh, to connect real world issues when we've got lots of stuff to finish uh, on in our handbooks, in our curriculums, in our classroom, uh, uh, you know, the syllabus, so to speak. Um, what is, according to you, if you were to say that there were a few things that we must talk about? or we should definitely include in our classroom teaching because of paucity of time, what would those things be? Darcy, let me, let me uh, ask you to take that one up first. Sure. Um, for me, the way that I look at um, global citizenship and, and the global goals, these sorts of things, is that it, I tend to try and sell it as an enhancement or a value add to what people are already doing. So, so I, I, I don't feel it should be extra. I just feel that we're... There's a lot of dead space within curriculum. It's packed, it is absolutely packed. And we have to get literacy and numeracy and all these sorts of different things. But I, I think global literacy and competency will add value to that traditional form of numeracy and literacy and these sorts of things because you're making it life worthy. It's life worthy learning. It's not just like, oh, we've now got to attach on the SDGs to everything, which Lenny certainly made a, a wonderful case that she doesn't just attach it on. She uses it to, to then enhance all of that other learning that's going to happen. So, so I think rather than trying to reschedule your time, reschedule your approach to how you're planning your lessons or your things 
And and for me personally, I mean, I, I've been doing this for a long time, but I always start with global citizenship and then think about, okay, well, where do I then add in the components of, of numeracy and these sorts of things? So, yeah, so that, that's, that's the approach that I tend to use or just start slowly with little bits and, and then see how it goes. Thank you, Darcy. That was really, really useful uh, to change the approach as opposed to picking um, and leaving a few things out. Lenny, what would be your take on things that must be included? So again, reevaluate what you think is worth learning, as I showed. And it doesn't have to be that you change your curriculum. For example, I was talking about these design starters, so I'll very, very quickly share them. Regardless of what my unit is, I can start getting in my class with these um, starters. It will be an object on the board, and I say, what do you think this is? Hands up, and we discuss it. So that can take me just five minutes. This one, for example, is the child-friendly um, I think it's either insulin pen or blood tester, or what do you think these shoes are? And then, oh, okay, actually these shoes are made from chewing gum. So that is completely separate from my unit and it's a very quick thing I can do. I also have seen that obviously at the moment, if you are teaching face-to-face, -face, you probably have um, maybe students sitting in clusters, so you go to them, or if you have students online, you can't necessarily do this in the same way. But I have seen that other teachers will put an article on their door so students are waiting to come to class. They can see a quick, relevant article that you've seen in the news, something that you've seen that's interesting. Um, and again, like bringing your passions to the classroom. If you're, if you're really, really interested in, like for me, I'm interested in um, wrongful incarceration in prisons. Hmm. Sometimes I bring that into class and they can feel that I'm passionate about it. So don't yes. feel like you have to do every single goal and talk about every single issue. Link in your passions. They'll see that this space your classroom is a space where people can talk about things they're interested in and then they'll bring in their passions as well. You don't have to cover everything. You don't have to change your curriculum. You don't have to dedicate too much time to it. Even things like we teach through Microsoft Teams and in my team, which is a class, I have channels along the side mm -hmm. um, and I just have one called Interesting Links. And literally, I just saw that you shared that really nice resource, which was a 19th century view of the vision of the year 2000 just copy paste that link and I put it in there. But it could be the same thing of a news article, a TED talk, etc. cetera. So, quick, Thank short, you. small. Thank you so much for that. Um, Anshuman, according to you, the top three things or the top two things that you think teachers must talk about in their classrooms today? I mean, honestly, just listen to the children because uh, the amount of awareness that they have about these SDG goals is an order of magnitude than all of us here put together. And uh, if you just allow even unstructured time for them to pick up a topic and explore it through these various different dimensions, then these goals could come in not as something that has been mandated top down from some very important sounding body or uh, important sounding people. It could come, uh, it would come organically from, from the kids themselves. And, uh, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not an educator, I haven't been in the environment, so I'm, sure I'm not uh, qualified to speak, but involve the parents, maybe not everyone, but then you would find enough parents uh, who would just love to go explore along with the children um, these, these topics. So maybe there's something in there which is outside of the boundaries of curriculum and outside of the school time that you could potentially leverage. Absolutely. And teachers, if you're looking for an involved parent, you have one right here on the panel. So you can always reach out to Anshuman uh, in case you're All of us are. Yeah. an interesting parent to, uh, to connect with. Absolutely. So thank you to Anshuman, to Darcy and to Lenny for such a fantastic session. The fact that we've gone 20 minutes over time and people are still here just goes to show how much everybody's enjoyed today's discussion. Uh, I thank you all for the fantastic inputs and insights, for all the wonderful strategies for bringing your world and your perspectives uh, to today's discussion. Uh, participants, I hope that you've gone away from this session with uh, some interesting ideas, um, some things to think about or reflect on as teachers yourselves uh, that you can take away straight away to your own classrooms. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you back next Friday at the same time uh, to talk about hybrid classrooms which have now been uh, permitted by the Indian government uh, with the schools opening up for grades nine and upwards uh, from the 21st of September. So we're going to talk a little bit about that next week and how you can adapt to that. On that note, thank you once again to all the wonderful panelists and to all the fantastic participants. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening ahead. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.